Good morning. How are you guys doing? Good. Well, you have been enjoying the beautiful weather this weekend. Oh, man. My wife just got back. She just landed on an airplane like a few minutes ago. So I am so happy. It's been eight days of, of uh, bachelor dad. Uh, not really. Of three kids. Single dad dadding it for... Uh, well, no, she still did stuff for me while she was gone. You know how she prepares things ahead of time? So it's like her goodness continues even while she's gone uh, in the house. So I'm just so happy that she's back home. <laughs> like, yay. It's like where the kids said, dad was sad. Are you kidding me? Like, I was like, I, you appreciate your wife when she's gone for that many days. Uh, even more, she was my oldest daughter at a speech and debate tournament. And so um, it's good to have her back home. I'm just so happy to see her when I'm done preaching. So you're dismissed. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, uh, all right. Yeah, I'm half kidding. No, this will be the shortest sermon I ever preached. Um, but I'm happy that Grace is home. And so uh, they had a great time. And we had, we had fun while she was gone. Even the kids said, this has been so fun to have more time with you, Dad. So it was a special time. So it was good. Um, but I want to let you in on a little secret since you're at church on Memorial Day weekend. That's right. Um, we're having Sean and Krista Smith for Revival Nights. They're our special speakers. Friday, Saturday, Sunday night, Sunday morning. You don't want to miss this couple. Krista is a powerful preacher and a prophetic minister, and Sean is one of my favorite preachers. I feel like a lot of people in the Pentecostal world don't preach anymore, and Sean preaches like his sermons that are powerful and insightful and revelatory, and you do not want to miss this couple. Um, and uh, it, they, there's so much I could say, but I want to let's pack the place out with people that need Jesus, that aren't saved. You got friends that uh, this would be a great time for them to hear about Jesus, to hear uh, a message of hope for people that need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. They'll, they'll minister times for healing and prophetic. There'll be times of healing and prophetic ministry. You won't want to miss it on uh, any of the nights. It'll, it'll be a really powerful time. We're really honored to have them back. Uh, so we are continuing our series, The Kingdom Power of a Disciple. And today I want to talk to you about the School of Miracles. See, I've got something birthing in my spirit, and it's raw, and it's real, and it's full of hope. But I'm here today to talk to people that have experienced disappointment. I'm here today to talk about people that are under pressure, that are believing God for a miracle, or you believe God for a miracle in the past season of your life, and you're wondering why things didn't turn out the way that they did. I'm here for people that have questions today, that have questions as somebody that believes in Jesus, or maybe you don't yet believe in Jesus. You're a, you, you're a skeptic. You're curious. You're wondering about, is God really real? I'm here to talk to people today that have prayed for something and felt like it didn't turn out the way that you anticipated or that you thought it would. And I'm here to, I'm here to see God birth a, a revolution in a people, to birth revival in us, to be a people that will go the long haul, that won't give up, that will persevere, that will believe God in spite of what we see or feel. And I'm here to call us to love, to love Jesus today, to enter into people's stories, to enter into people's mess and brokenness with love and mercy and with God's goodness that Jesus would manifest his face in people's darkest hour and that he would do it through a people who are convinced that he's thoroughly good that it, it, through and through that he's good and that he's the same yesterday today and forever and the same Jesus we see in the pages of scripture is the same heart of Jesus today that he wants to minister through his people and I'm here as we're talking about the kingdom power, not just for people that need a miracle, although this will apply to you, or those that need to experience the healing power of God, but those that want to see the healing power of God flow through their lives to touch others who are in need. And I want to start in the context and give you a framework that maybe you're going to have to pay attention today to, think, to, to hear um, something that maybe you haven't seen in Jesus' life or teaching before. I'm not teaching you something new that's outside of the Bible, but it might be new to you. In Mark 8, verse 1, there's a story of Jesus, and he's with his disciples. It says there's a large crowd that had gathered. And since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called the disciples to him and said, Hey, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. And his disciples answered, But where is this remote place? Where in this remote place can we can anyone get enough bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground, and when he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people, and they did so. They had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. 
The people ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls full of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 were present after he had sent them away. He got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalmanutha. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus to test him, and they asked him for a sign from heaven. And he sighed deeply and said, oh, Why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to it. And then he left them, but got back into the boat and crossed to the other side. And the disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they, they had had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. And they discussed this with one another and said, Is it because we have no bread? At where of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember... When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I spoke, when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? So Jesus had broken bread and fish and he multiplied them. Right, And then he gets in this boat with the disciples. But before he gets on the boat, the Pharisees stop him. He just got done multiplying food for 4,000 people, which would have really been 4,000 men, according to their counting method, plus women and children. So thousands of people. Jesus multiplies this little meal. right? And then the Pharisees roll up, and they're like, give me a sign. It's like, you just multiplied food for 4,000 people, and you want another sign. Now, see, this scripture is very often used by cynics and skeptics of the miraculous to charge charismatics or Pentecostal Christians that believe that God does miracles to say that they shouldn't seek God for miracles because only wicked and adulterous generations, Jesus gives that warning at other times to the Pharisees as well, or that he says, you know, why do you, does this generation seek a sign in a rebuke, right? And they go, you shouldn't seek God for miracles, but you see, the only time that Jesus rebukes people for seeking a sign is the people that are skeptics and cynics that are not doing it with a heart that if he did it, they would believe. It's the people that are like, it's never enough. Like, you gotta really prove yourself to me. And he's calling them on the carpet in skepticism. Jesus never gives these words to someone who has an actual need in their life or even a need for a family member or friend. Like a centurion says, I've got a soul, I've got a servant that needs to be healed. Jesus doesn't go, you wicked and adulterous generation seeking a sign. You should just believe in me spiritually. I shouldn't have to do anything for you. He never does that. He heals the Gentile's servant, right? He never goes, Jesus, my, my son is sick. Oh, you wicked and adulterous generation, you're only gonna serve me if I heal your child? You should just believe in the spiritual benefits that I offer to you. No, he never, ever does that. The only rebuke he gives is to the religious people, the religious spirit that is coming and demanding, like, do some hocus pocus, do some little sign in the sky, you know, give us some extra proof, and whatever he does is never enough. There were plenty of signs that Jesus did throughout his life in ministry to confirm his preaching that he is who he said he was and ultimately of course that he said he would raise from the dead it's not that just that Jesus rose from the dead it's that he said that his messiahship that, that him being Lord and Savior of the world it was staked on him being buried and risen from the dead so that is the ultimate sign right but that, that's uh, uh, to a wicked and adulterous generation that vindicates his claims of who he truly is but there were plenty of signs that he performed in his life, in his ministry, to show that he was who he said that he was, that he, did, he is the king of kings and lord of lords, and that he does have power over all. But so in the middle of that, so Jesus kind of rebukes the religious leaders, but again, he does not rebuke people that need miracles for themselves or that love and care for people that need a miracle in their life. So on the way, they get in a boat, and uh, Jesus is like, uh, he throws out this little statement like, beware of the, the leaven, the, the influence of, of the Pharisees and of Herod. And what is he saying? Or the, He's saying, beware of the political spirit and beware of the religious spirit. And there's a kingdom influence. There's a kingdom power that the believers of Jesus are supposed to live under. And then in Mark 8, it's, I think it's the only time where he talks about the leaven of Herod. Other times he talks, or the yeast of Herod. And other times he talks about the yeast or the leaven of the Pharisees as well, but we're to stay away from the wrong influences. And they're like, is it because we don't have any bread or we just got one loaf? Like what's going? And you know, they're like, who's on first? Like, it's like the teacher asks a question and then you think you're in trouble. And it's like, maybe you're not in trouble, but you feel like, oh, I should know the answer to this. 
And so they're kind of coming up short with their answer. And then Jesus teaches them something powerful. He's, he's, he, he reminds them about when he had fed the 5,000 in a previous story, in a previous time, and how they had 12 basketfuls left over. And then he reminds them of what had just taken place, that he had just fed the 4,000 men plus women and children, and they had seven basketfuls left over. And he says, don't you guys understand? And they're like, they're kind of baffled. But what is he saying? He's saying every miracle is a school. Every miracle is a masterclass and an opportunity to transform and renew our mind about the way that we see the nature and character of God. Why is he rebuking the disciples? Because they don't remember what had happened because they were supposed to face their current lack or their next need or their next, next obstacle with the faith from what they learned in their last miracle. So a miracle is more than just this cool thing that God does. It's, it's, a, it's a window into his nature. It's, it's a way to see him in a new way and then to see the mountains and obstacles that you're going to face in the future ahead of you. It's a way for you to see yourself in a new light. Maybe to see the shortcomings and the ways that you need to grow. But I'm talking to you about the school of miracles. With Christ in the school of miracles, he wants to teach us something through the invitation to be a follower of his that represents kingdom power to the world around us. So Father, I pray for this few minutes that we have to get into your word today. I ask that you would show up today, that you would heal the sick, that you would set free the oppressed, that you would save someone who is lost. And oh God, I pray that today that you would do a work in us, that we would be a company of people. Lord, that this church family, Sunrise Christian Center, we would be a people that we're in it for the long haul, that we're committed to run into the gutter with people that are hurting, that are broken, that are sick, that are oppressed, and that we would, we would come with your love and your power, that we would come not just with optimism or positive thoughts or feelings, but we would come with a genuine faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and that we would represent you well to the world around us, Lord God, that in the mundane and the ordinary, in the times of pressure and confusion, that you would find in us a faithfulness to the gospel that you would find in us a faithfulness to your glory and to your name being honored and to people experiencing who you really are in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So the school of miracles. Every miracle is a blessing or a school and or a school or a test and or a judgment. Miracles are most obviously first a blessing. They're a gift of love. Right? God does miracles for people because he loves people. In Jesus' life and ministry, he does not separate doing spiritual things and doing physical things. These people are hungry. Since you're hungry, let that rumble in your belly remind you of how weak and frail you are and how if you believe in me, one day you'll go to heaven where there's no lack of food. I hope you don't pass out on the way home. Have a nice day. Doesn't do it. He cares about the physical and the spiritual. Doesn't walk up to somebody who's, uh, Jesus, open up my blind eyes. Well, this blindness was given to you so that you might know that spiritually you're really blind and I will be most glorified if you stay blind the rest of your life and you just have a good attitude and you thank me every day no matter what. Doesn't do it. We just do not see it in the life and the person of Jesus. So I have a hard time reading that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then thinking that he wants to do something different now, that all of a sudden he doesn't care about people's physical needs because he only cares about spiritual needs. This is a kind of a twist of the Gnostic heresy that, that, that spiritual is good and that physical is bad. The, the earthly physical realm, what we can touch and see doesn't matter to God. Now we can argue theologically that the thing that Jesus cares the most about is not the physical, is the spiritual in the sense that, that this is a temporary world that's passed away. Right, And so the greatest miracle certainly, and I mean no bones about it, is that when a lost soul, someone who's in their sin and is separated from God, repents of their sin and turns to Jesus as Lord because they believe that he died on the cross and rose from the dead and their soul is reborn and filled with God's spirit and they find and, and their life in God. That's the greatest miracle of, of all is when one sinner repents. Come on, that's the greatest miracle. But there are many miracles. And when Jesus was confronted with people that were sick, he would say, what's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or rise up and walk. He didn't say, it's more important that your sins are forgiven. Who cares if you rise up and walk? He's like, both and. I'm always like, do you want the brownie or the ice cream? Both. <laughs> do I got a pick? <laughs> We limit God. We create these hierarchies that God doesn't always create. And, and, and so we 
we, we see, though, that, that a, a, a healing is most obviously, a miracle is most obviously a blessing because God loves people and he wants to forgive sin. He wants to heal the sick. He wants to raise the dead. I believe that the scripture is, is pretty clear that God's will is to heal the sick, that God's will is to save all people. In God's perfect will, right, that there, everybody gets saved. In God's perfect will, everybody gets healed. People live a blessed life. People live in obedience. People live free from shame. People live free from guilt. People live free from violence. People feel, live free from oppression. This is, this is why Christians uh, build hospitals and cre create uh, schools because we believe that people should have, be literate so they can read the Bible and know God. And they can live a life that's blessed and prosperous. That's why we believe that if, if everybody loved their neighbor as themselves, that the world would be a better place and that God would be glorified in us loving our neighbor more and not committing acts of evil and crime against one another, right? So, uh, but when it comes to healing, people get so weird about it. Like, I think maybe it's God's will that I stay sick. God loves to bless people just because he loves people. Because he cares about human need. He cares about human need. He cares about the afflictions. He cares about the suffering that we go through. And Jesus came to pay for our sins, but he also came to pay for the healing of our sickness and to overthrow oppression and evil so that people could be free and that people could live a life of blessing and peace. Amen. So it's, miracles are most obviously a blessing for us, but miracles are also a school or a class. Like we see in the story in Mark. Jesus said, what do, don't you guys understand? You guys missed something. He was trying to teach them. He, he, he was primarily there to bless all the people out of his compassion. But in the middle of that miracle, it was a school that if they would have paid attention and said, guys, we're in school. Then the next time they came against lack, the next time they came against a need, there was something he was expecting that they could have done. Maybe he was like, guys, what if you thanked me and blessed the bread, the one loaf that you had? and broke it? What if it would multiply in your hands again? Because you learned who I am. You learned something about what he had called you to. In Luke 9 and 10, we see this over and over, this idea of Jesus teaching lessons through giving out his kingdom power. So in Luke 9, the disciples have been commissioned to go heal the sick, preach the gospel, cast out demons, raise the dead. And in Luke 9, towards the end, getting towards the end of that chapter, I don't have time to read the whole chapter today, so I'm just going to give you a few little uh, nuggets from there, is that Jesus comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration, and there's a boy that is demon-oppressed, and he's, he's sick, and the disciples, who are the best besides Jesus at the time at doing miracles and casting out demons, because Jesus was walking with them, and he had given them the authority, they couldn't cast the Spirit out. Now, some people get confused when Jesus, you, get, you start getting excited about praying for people and, 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 and God using you. And then you go and like all of a sudden, it's like, it's not that easy. You thought healing was like the vending machine, like you stick in the Bible promise, you hit B12, and then it's like, wait, maybe I wanted B11 and that didn't work right. It's stuck. It's stuck in the machine. And you try to shake it and you're like, come out, please come out, miracle. I did the right thing. I pushed the right number. And we create, we, we, we approach these things like everything's going to be like a tiptoe through the tulips with Jesus. Oh man, the, they, I got a prophetic word. I was reading the Bible. God spoke to me. He's going to use me to heal the sick. He's going to use me to do great things. I have a destiny. I'm a world changer. And you go to a conference, a revival meeting, a, you know, and you get all charged up and the disciples are all charged up because like Jesus had given them authority. And then they roll up and they're having a problem. And Jesus comes down and he's like, what is going on here? And they're like, well, your disciples tried to do it, but they couldn't heal my boy. And the dad's like, I believe, help my unbelief. And so Jesus is like, rebukes them. How long am I going to bear with you? Couldn't do this because he rebukes their unbelief. And what happens when God gives us kingdom power to be a follower of Jesus is that it exposes our unbelief at times. I believe when somebody comes to you that's sick, can you pray for me? Oh, yeah, I can pray for you. Oh, like me right now? Uh, if it be your will, God, I don't know what to say. I think I'm supposed to say Jesus maybe. Help out this person. They've been really nice. If you're praying for people to be healed on how nice they are or how many years they served in Sunday school or were an usher in the church, like just have somebody else like go, right? We don't, we don't pray based on our own need or our own merit or what we've earned. We pray according to who Christ is and what he's done for us through his finished work. That is our basis to pray for healing. And so 
when we, it's very easy to be cynical of other people that have healing ministries. Oh yeah, that person, they said they prayed for people and look at they, some of the people they prayed for died or some of the people's like, it's easy to be a cynic. It's easy to sit on the sidelines and criticize people, but Jesus is calling us to get in the game. He told the disciples the same way that I, that the father sent me, I'm sending you. The, the, whole, the whole idea of apostolic succession was that the apostles, what they were taught, they were supposed to teach to all the followers of Jesus who are supposed to teach it to the next generation of all the followers of Jesus. And God has not just called the apostles or the, the superheroes or the super saints or God's man or woman of power for the hour to show up and do miracles. He's called all of us to confront darkness to confront sin and sickness with the goodness of the gospel and his love and his power to pray for people who are hurting and broken that the face of Jesus might manifest to people in their darkest hour. And when you start to do that, when you start to get engaged in actually praying and caring about what is happening to other people in your life, you get confronted with unbelief because you'll find those things. It'll be, this is, this will be the very opportunities that God uses to show you areas that you need to become more like Jesus. Then a little later in Luke 9, 46, <laughs> the disciples start arguing about who's the greatest because they got power, baby. <laughs> now, it's not wrong to have a lot of confidence. Even the apostles, our, our media guy, James, he should join his team. We need more camera people. And, uh, but he's, James is awesome. And James is like, man, isn't it crazy how in Acts 3, how the apostles even like, they go to the gate beautiful and there's a man that's lame from birth and he's, he's like, do you have anything? And they're like, look at us. He goes, could you imagine walking down the street when somebody, or somebody needs prayer for healing? You're like, look at me. It was like they were so confident that, like, they could look, that this man could look at them because they had Jesus. They had the Spirit of God. And it wasn't arrogance that it's, they're like, we're the healers, look at us. I mean, anytime someone tried to worship them or praise them, the apostles in the book of Acts would rip their clothes and say, we are mere humans. Like, don't give us any glory. But there was a confidence that they carried the person and the work of Christ through the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit. They're like, look at me. So there's this confidence. But then there's also an arrogance that can rise with people that have been given power and authority by Jesus. And so Jesus they're like, which one of us is the best? And most people are too sophisticated not to say dumb stuff like that. <laughs> you know, but we think it, like, at least I'm not as messed up as him or her. I mean, <laughs> man, I'm more anointed than they are. It's very easy in a church, too, just to, you know, to think, well, at my church, we believe in miracles. We believe the full gospel. We're full gospel Christians. And that's fine to say that you're a full gospel Christian, but if you mean it that you're a full gospel Christian and the Presbyterians aren't, or the Baptists aren't, or the Methodists aren't, or the, you know, whatever, then, then you start wearing these things like pride and think we, we are better than. That's what pride is, is that who's the greatest? It's not thinking, having confidence in who God says you are and what his word. That's not pride or arrogance. People will accuse, when you want to step into healing ministry and pray for others, people will accuse you of pride and arrogance. Let them accuse you of that. And it'll usually be other Christians that don't think it's for today today or have a problem with people exhibiting confidence in God. Don't let that, you got to get over that. You just got to, you just got to, you got to get over that. But, but it is true that when you start thinking that you're better than or you're greater than, I want to tell you, I've seen people that have, I've seen people's lives wrecked in the ministry that used to claim that everybody they pray for got healed. Is this about Jesus or about you? Is this about who's the greatest among men? No, Jesus had to rebuke them of their pride and their arrogance. He's the one that gave them this power and authority. And yet he had to rebuke them for it because I'm telling you, it was the very power and authority he gave them that was also, a, it was a blessing to the people they were ministering to, but it was also a test for them. It was also a school for them. It was class time with Jesus and they weren't passing the test, but that was okay because it was gonna be an opportunity for them to grow and mature as they walked with him. Then a little later in Luke 9, <laughs> Then they're upset because other disciples somewhere else are casting out demons in Jesus' name. <laughs> and so they deal with jealousy and insecurity. And it's like, man, people that think the apostles, do they just like float on the ground with Jesus and they're all like doing miracles and like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I have this anointing from God. You're about to go to school if you got an anointing from God. <laughs> You're about to go through class and be in a test. So <laughs> they're, they're all like, Jesus, can you believe it? There's these other guys that say they're your disciples and they're walking around and they're casting out demons in your name. And Jesus is like, who cares? Praise God. If they're not against us, they're for us. If they're not, they're on team Jesus. 
And we get so hung up over like who really had the revival and who's, you know, man, we gotta, we gotta be so careful of that stuff. Well, you know, the revival in the whole region is gonna break out in your church, right? That's, you want that kind of weight? You want that kind of pride? Like, just like wherever Jesus wants to pour out, I just wanna be hungry. I just wanna be in a company of people that are so hungry for Jesus. That whether we're honored or whether we're despised, it's just like we just want more of him and more of his glory and his power to manifest in this hour. And so they're, they're, all, inse- they're all insecure and jealous. And then things aren't getting better. <laughs> things are de-escalate. Or they're getting worse. And so they, <laughs> they come through a town, and they're supposed to be on a commission to heal and love people and help these cities. And then they're like, hey, Jesus, that city over there, should we call down fire and just torch them all? Let's just burn the city. Now, I, it, we could be a little sanctimonious, but I know some people are a little upset about certain cities and certain things that are Christians today that are like, I won't even drive through that city. I can't believe that the, their policy, they're doing this. And we get so, and we're supposed to heal the city, love the city, get in the gutter with the people that need Jesus and see God's prophetic vision even when there's brokenness. And Jesus to rebuke and be like, you don't even know what spirit you're of. Like, come on, guys. So they're, now they're, they're supposed to be having kingdom power to love and help people and heal the sick. And now they're angry and wrathful. And Jesus has to rebuke them again. And then in Luke 10, Jesus tells them, hey, you know what? You're going to go. You'll be commissioned. I'll read a few verses from there in just a moment. I'm going to commission you to go. And by the way, some of the places you go are going to reject you. And you're like... I thought I was going to heal people and set people free and they were going to be happy with me. They're not going to have pain or sickness or disease anymore. I'm going to tell them good news about Jesus. I'm going to love on them. And no, they're going to reject you at times. And Jesus said, you're going to have to shake the dust off your feet so that rejection doesn't cling to you and influence your future ministry. And you're like, I just want everybody to like me. Well, like you think having kingdom power, being a disciple of Jesus is about everybody liking you, then you signed up, you got the wrong sales pitch. Do you remember the Princess Bride? Life is pain, Highness. And anything that tells you otherwise is trying to sell you something. Right? Jesus, <laughs> Jesus does not give us an easy road. Jesus did not give us an easy life. He did not promise us a pain-free followership. <laughs> right? Where you follow me and your life will be easy. He's like, follow me and you'll deny yourself and you'll take up your cross. And that's how you'll follow me. And so he, he, warned, he warned about how people could reject them. And then he had to rein in their attitude because they have some great success later in Luke 10 that my dad referenced last week where they come back and they're like, Jesus, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And I wonder what the real experience was like. It was like, you should have seen Peter. He got up there and he was like, you know what he told that demon? Oh my goodness, that was so funny. And they're, they're bragging, they're totally pumped about how much authority they have over demons. And Jesus is like, you guys, don't be so impressed. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. What should impress you is that your names are written in heaven and that's where your source of rejoicing should be. Rejoice not over your victory over evil, but rejoice in who you are as sons and daughters of God, that your names are written in heaven, that you're forgiven, that you have a new identity. That's the source of our joy. That's the source of our victory. That's, that's the thing that no one can take away from us. And then in Luke 10, he tells us that miracles can also be a part of God's judgment. He says in Luke 10, verse 8, when you enter a town and you're welcomed and eat what is offered to you, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near you. But when you enter a town and are not welcome, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe off from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this. The kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed and you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on at that judgment then for you and you Capernaum will will you be lifted up to the heavens no you will go back down to Hades whoever listens to you listens to me whoever rejects you rejects me but whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me so Jesus is like okay guys when I send you out there and you go sit there you speak peace to people he had said that previously in Luke 10 And then they let you in, sit with them and eat with them and then heal the sick that are there and then preach the gospel, tell them that the kingdom has come near. So what's he saying? He's like, if you're going out to speak peace to people and you hang out and eat with people and you heal the sick and perform miracles and you tell them and they reject you, then there's nothing else left. 
Like now that miracle that was supposed to be a blessing for them will be a sign of God's judgment against them on judgment day that vindicates God's goodness, that he did reach out to them in kindness, but they shut the door on the only one that could save them. And so when God does miracles for people and starts doing miracles among us, it also is important that we respond in repentance, that we deal with things in our life that are not pleasing to God. Because sometimes a miracle can be a turning point for someone's life. Sometimes it can be a time where God is trying to reach you and in the middle of someone's sin and brokenness, um, there was a, uh, maybe I shared it in this series, but there was, a, uh, there was a young man that was here and he was not living for God and he was brought by a woman who was um, like in the middle of a marriage uh, breakup and heading towards divorce and she brought another guy to church and I was mad because I was like, why are you at church with another guy that's not your husband? You're not even divorced and you're already bringing another guy to church. And I'm just like, God, this isn't right. And then I'm like, maybe I'm being judgmental. Maybe it's a cousin. Maybe it's a friend. I shouldn't, you know, I'm like, but I knew a little bit of the backstory, but I wasn't clear. And I'm like, Ugh. and so like, then I get up to transition. Uh, this is several years ago. And uh, I'd get up to do the transition from worship before my dad would come up and preach. And I said, you know, I just feel like there's somebody here and you've got this problem with your shoulder. I believe, uh, uh, and God wants to heal you. And so who comes forward is the guy that I'm angry that she's at church with this guy. And he comes forward and comes right up to me. And he's like, uh, there's like this thing with my shoulder. And I'm like, okay, can I just pray? And I'm like, yeah, I pray real quick. I think I pray a second time real quick. And he moves it, and he goes, oh, blank. He cusses right at the altar. And he's like, I'm sorry. I'm not used to, I, don't, I don't usually come to church. I'm not used to, I, don't, I don't know what's happening right now. He's like, I, I couldn't. And so like, he goes and sits down and looks like a deer in the headlights. Like, and he's showing them. He's going like, I don't know what's happening right now. Well, it turns out he was in the military. He was in reserves, and he was going to be medically discharged because of an injury. He couldn't perform his physical duties. Uh, in the times that he had to serve. He couldn't even do a push-up. And after that, he could do pull-ups. He could, I mean, he, he like got completely healed and did not have to leave his service. And he gave his life to Jesus within the next couple weeks. And in the middle of that mess, in the middle of the brokenness, God reached out to him and it caused him to give his life to Jesus. But what could happen at times is that people have experienced a miracle and they become ungrateful. They become cynical. They think that God is endorsing their lifestyle, that everything they're doing is okay, that they don't need to repent of their sin, but since God loves me and healed me and just wants to bless me, no, I'm here to say it in the nicest possible way. A miracle can also be a watershed moment that, that is God saying, you need to choose which path you're gonna be on. And I'm coming to you, I want you to know I'm coming to you in my, in my love. I'm coming to you in my goodness because I wanna woo your heart. I wanna draw your heart. And it could be a sign that, hey, you, can, you need to get things right. And you see that when revival was poured out, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the early church, Ananias and Sapphira dropped dead. Right, and, like the things happen that uh, in God's in God's holiness, it's when the Spirit is poured out. There's great power, but there's also a great need for repentance and holiness in those times. And it's not like God's like, you know, I'm gonna smash you. Yo, yo, like like we're supposed to preach. Yeah, and if you don't repent, then God's just gonna. It's it's not about that kind of vengeance and like anger. It's about it's a genuine concern. It's it's like a heart of grief. That's like, don't you get it? Like if you turn your back on the one who's gone out of his way to show you his love and break into your pain, and you turn your back on him, he's the only one. You turn your back on the cross. You turn your back on Christ. Then there's no more salvation for you. There's nothing else to cling to on Judgment Day. And when God goes over and above to get someone's attention, then he really wants their attention for their own good. And if they harden their heart at that time, there's just nothing else that's left for them. That's the reality. So miracles test us and expose our sin, our unbelief, and our doubt. See, <laughs> we thought Jesus is going to call us on the love boat. <laughs> but he called us to a battleship, church. He called us to a battleship. Jesus calls us off the shores of our comfort and he calls us onto the seas of adventure. It's a journey. It's a journey to follow Jesus. And if you think that, that following him and being a disciple and God has great things for your life and you're gonna be a world changer, like just living the normal Christian life is hard. Just living at peace with all people. Daily reading your Bible and praying. Just getting involved. Do you think that every day people wake up and then have like these supernatural visions and see angels all day and they're like, and they, like they just wake up in your normal 
normal course of your life. And if you want to see God use you in miracles, you've got to get used to the journey. You've got to realize there's all these things that he's going to confront in you. Now, I believe that God's will is so clear in the Bible about healing. I, I, I believe it's super clear. But, but so I don't pray for people and go, well, it's a process and a journey. I mean, everybody's in a process and journey. So sometimes we give that encouragement. But what I'm talking about today is those that want to see the miracles in the lives of others is that you pursuing miracles is that you might you might walk with a limp every once in a while. In a sense, you might have some questions that are unanswered. You might have some unbelief or anger, some pride or jealousy, some insecurity or rejection that you deal with. And God is trying to get at those things in your life so that you can be more like Jesus. Jesus. And you got to be committed to the long haul. You got to be committed to persevere in the midst of odds and obstacles and pressures that come at every angle if you want to be a follower of Jesus. At times in this journey, we'll live with more questions than answers. If God wants to perform, I love what somebody, it's an unknown author, said this if God wants to perform a small miracle, he places us in difficult circumstances. If he wants to perform a mighty miracle, he places us in impossible circumstances. You see, when you want to be a follower of Jesus and represent Jesus to those around you, he's going to place you in impossible circumstances. And he wants to develop in us an appetite for the impossible, which makes us very uncomfortable. This could apply to a miracle in our own life, but I'm talking today that you want, you're a disciple that wants to see God's love and power invade the lives of others. See, when pursuing God to use you to heal the sick and see miracles, you're going to routinely face the impossible. And it's impossible for you to face the impossible and not have a confrontation with your limitations. You see, so, but Jesus does this for us. <laughs> These, these, these times of the miraculous, this invitation, him giving us his, his power and authority, it, it, these moments can become like a mirror. I mean, the word is the ultimate mirror. The word is the ultimate teacher. But the teacher himself tells us that we should be learning out of the miraculous. We should be learning about thankfulness. We should be learning about endurance. We should be learning about what God really wants to do. And our mind is so formed by what we see and we get all these prophetic words from family members. You know, our family's like this. You're not gonna, you're not gonna escape. You're not gonna overcome that obstacle. You got, you got the people at the bank telling you, prophesying about your finances and your debt and your bankruptcy. You got people that are speaking all kinds of words over you about your health, the doctors and the specialists and family members and so-called friends, that people that are trying to be helpful. You've got all these people speaking words over you and over those that you care about. And then if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you come into those broken situations that feel impossible. Jesus talks about doing the impossible. That means that things don't look like they're working out. And we're always looking, well, what's the silver lining? Maybe that'll work. And, uh, but like we, 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 when we get into these situations, that's a good time for us to find out where we're really at with God and to find out who Jesus really is. See, God uses the miraculous to confront areas that we need to grow and develop Christ-likeness. I love what Rob Reimer says in his book, Soul Care. Your next level with God lies beyond the boundary of your current experience. The only way to get there is to risk more than you are comfortable with. Your next level with God lies beyond the boundary of your current experience. The only way to get there is to risk more than you are comfortable with. You know, people are like, I want to learn to cast out devils. I've been in certain rooms that, man, I thought I wanted to cast out devils, but then it got scary. <laughs> Say, like, I shouldn't be in this room all alone. What am I doing here? Jesus. Right? You gotta, but then you got to get into that boundary beyond what you're comfortable with. You, you want to see people's lives turned around from addiction. You want to see people helped. You want to see people blessed. See, the call to follow Jesus into the impossible, to bring us into our next level of God, is that he calls us and we get the privilege and the high honor of coming into somebody else's story of pain and tragedy and coming with a perspective that we see everything well and we see everything right and we see everything turned around because of who Jesus is and what he promises in the midst of it not looking like that at all. And so this is a part of our development. This is a part of our discipleship is to go into situation and to take risks, right? How do you spell faith? It was a John Wimber statement, R-I-S-K. You, you've got to jump into to greater measures of faith. You've got to step into risk. 
You've got to take that risk to pray for somebody. You've got to take that risk to share the gospel. You've got to take that risk to show love to somebody who's unlovable. You've got to, you've got to get into people's stories and, and realize that things, you might not have all the answers. It, you might not look really good. You might get rejected, but you might also see the miracle of God. You might see the dead raised, right? Like everybody wants a resurrection. Nobody wants to die, right? We don't want anybody to die. We don't, but, but, but he said to raise the dead. I have prayed for, I think, three or four dead bodies now, and I'm, I'm 0 for three or four. But I've had people in their families that say, would you come pray? Or could you pray? I was in a hospital in the Philippines when somebody died like the moment we got in the room. And it was, I said, could we pray? And so we prayed because Jesus said, because we see in the scripture that not everybody dies a timely death. And so if some people die out of God's time, I want to be available to be there. But it is a very difficult situation to enter into, to step into a morgue, to be there with a grieving family. And even though they're praying for resurrection, to pray there on a cold body, it's, it's a very strange experience. Pastor Kevin and Tara and uh, uh, Grace and I, we were on a double date and somebody called me and we were not that far away. And they're like, will you come to the, to the funeral home right now? And pray for this body. And they were like, that was quite a double date. <laughs> like we're out to dinner at one moment. And then we pull in to the morgue to pray for a dead body. But we're not going to see any dead people raised if we don't pray for any dead people to rise. It's taking Jesus at his word. But I tell you what, it's very awkward. It's very strange. It's very difficult. It's very humbling to pray and then have nothing happen. And then you have all those voices. People are going to think you're crazy. This doesn't work anyway. Does, have you ever seen this happen before? And you, get, you hear all that chatter. And it's an opportunity when the heat is turned on and the pressure rises for you to find out what, what's going on on the inside. Your, your risk might not be the same risk that God is calling me to take. But what risk is he calling you to take? What area of obedience is he calling you to step out in? You see, part of our formation is obedience to the mission and the call of Jesus. So what does it look like? It looks like loving the unlovely, embracing the sick and the dying, where we confront hopelessness with the goodness of God. It looks like miracles. It looks like heartache. It looks like grief. It looks like glory. It looks like humility and radical boldness. It's the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. It looks like Jesus. It looks like a cross and a resurrection. It looks like betrayal and suffering and great victory. See, the people that have the greatest victories, they've walked through the greatest sufferings. I think anybody that has a healing ministry that's significant, they've, they've, they've had the heartache. One of the, um, some of those precious people, just some of our greatest friends, they came to this church. He was less than, he's in his 30s and he had colorectal cancer and didn't look good. He had stage four and we became very close with their family and I've never seen a family fight in faith for healing like this. Uh, I've seen it since then, but up to that point in time, I had never seen it like that. And I remember being at his house, hospice was there. Uh, actually, they had three kids, and then he got his wife pregnant while he was battling stage four cancer. And while he was getting a cancer treatment in the hospital, his wife was giving birth to their fourth son that they said he wouldn't be able to have because of how much uh, process he was undergoing in his body with the, the drugs and the therapies and everything. And so he had his fourth saw his fourth son just for a few days before he would die. And I was, so I was, he was back in his house on hospice after, shortly after his fourth child was born. And uh, I went there at different times. And, um, you know, it's easy to, man, I remember, boy, even going into the cancer ward with him, you know, when he was going to get a chemo appointment and just the heaviness in that place. It was just like, uh, my heart was just so broken. But I was like, God, I don't want to, I don't want to ignore the pain and the suffering that people are in and just, man, it's just, uh, I want to have your heart. And so Dave was at home on hospice and his wife Jess was there and we're praying for his healing. And he, it was about as bad physically as you could look, like as sick as someone could look, I would imagine. Um, and Jess is sitting there, she's praying with us. She stands up, she's sticking his hand on her, his chest and she's going, Dave, you will live and not die. You will declare the things that God has done. We will travel the world and tell your testimony and you will preach the gospel. And, you know, and I was just like, this woman's faith. I'm like, Lord, let it be according to her faith. Like in the scriptures, right? Like that's what Jesus would say. Because it's just like, this woman is a woman of faith. 
and she's warring. And then her, her husband died a few days after that. Two or three days later, he was in heaven. And you know what? People were like, oh, she's pretty radical. It's gonna, I mean, she's, gonna, she's in for a rude awakening. It's really going to mess her up. If, if you believe that strong, it could be really bad if it doesn't work out. You know what? She never cursed God. And the same faith she had for his healing was the faith that carried her through the grief. And I, it, she's like, she carries an anointing. I saw her pray for people of cancer shortly thereafter that Jesus would heal people and that Jesus wants to heal sick people. And their kids, their faith is intact. God brought another man into their life and, and uh, they have a wonderful family and they have two more children now with their new husband and they're doing amazing. God is faithful. But I remember shortly after, like right after that memorial, I come to church and somebody comes to the altar and is like, could you pray for me? And I'm like, what's that? For cancer. And it was like, my, I, was, I was like, God, I don't have it in me. I'm just like, feel just, we, we lost a good one. Like he's a godly man. He just had a kid. You know, you're thinking of all like, God, how are you gonna leave this woman a widow and how is she gonna make it? And now I gotta pray and I, I didn't wanna have to face this so fast. But I realized, you know, my faith is not, my faith is not, in my experience or what I've seen. My faith is in the word of God. And so I prayed with faith in the name of Jesus that God would heal the next person of cancer. And I made a decision that no matter what I see or what I experience, John Wimber had one of the most prolific healing ministries in the American church in modern history. He said, for two years, we prayed for sick people week after week. And he was a part of a church that didn't believe in healing. Like he was trying to convince evangelicals that God could heal. And he's teaching from the Bible about healing, but it's not working for a couple years. And he's like, we would pray for sick people at the altar and we'd catch their colds. You know, the prayer team was getting sick. The sick people weren't getting healed. And he said, he crossed the line. He said, you know what? I will pray for sick people the rest of my life in ministry every single week, whether I see another person healed or not. And some people might call that crazy, but he said, I have to obey what Jesus told us to do as his followers. And what would break loose literally still has, there's still ripple effects from Wimber's ministry all across the body of Christ. And the way many people pray for the sick in any churches that do it is because of the, what he pioneered to be a part of the life of the local church and that training for everyday believers. Who, come on, who, everybody's a super Christian, by the way. There is no superheroes, but everybody has the Holy Spirit living in them that's a believer in Jesus, right? And so he pioneered something because he decided that he wouldn't give up and he let that journey of struggle and unanswered questions and he would, he mentored another guy that's uh, uh, known in the healing movement, uh, Randy Clark, for, for a period of time. And he, Randy used to travel with John Wimber from city to city. And he said, we'd go one night and John would get up and pray. And he'd say, come Holy Spirit, which is like his famous line in a meeting. He'd say, come Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit would be poured out on the room. And all these people would get healed of sicknesses, the craziest creative miracles, people delivered of demons and filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he goes, and then the next night he'd get up and he'd go, come Holy Spirit. And it would be like, nothing happened at all. And he would go, and Randy would be like, what happened? What did you do? And John's like, there's no more sin in my life than there was last night. I don't, I didn't feel any more anointed <laughs> last night than I do tonight. He goes, all I do is I do what Jesus told us to do. And I expect him to come and to honor his word. And then I trust God to do the rest, right? But God released a powerful move of healing. And the other thing is that God is calling us to be thankful for the big and the small. Oh, only headaches get healed. I've only seen this healed. Be thankful. Rejoice over every miracle. Rejoice over the little if you want to be faithful with much. Stay grateful in the midst of unanswered questions. You see, when Jesus called us to represent him, he called us off the shores of comfort and onto the seas of adventure. Church, he called us to... He called us to uh, to, to not just, just make it through, but he, he called us to represent him. When Jesus said, follow me, that's the game changer. Yes, we're to worship him and honor him. We never become like another Messiah. We never get to like become a God like that, right? But, but what he did say, see, a lot of Christians are comfortable saying, to some degree, not everybody, but some are comfortable saying, Jesus be my Lord, Jesus be my Savior, but follow him, become like him. The Bible says that the journey's never complete in this life. Don't get me wrong. As close as I want to come to being more like Jesus before I die, there's still going to be a big change when I see him face to face. First John says, when I see him, I will be like him, for I will see him as he is. So there's a greater transformation for all of us, but what God is after, all of us are image bearers of God. We're made in his image and likeness physically, but he's after us being image bearers spiritually. 
He's after our spiritual maturity so that we look more like Jesus. I agree with my dad's theology on this. I think that's the ultimate thing that Christians are going to be evaluated on Judgment Day. We're not evaluated. If you're a believer in Jesus, you don't get evaluated for heaven or hell. You pass from death to life. You've passed from judgment into God's uh, mercy uh, if you've accepted Jesus and repented of your sin in this life. But we will be evaluated for loss or reward as a believer in Jesus. And I believe the ultimate thing will be like, how much more did we look like Jesus than when we first believed? He wants to see a reflection of his son in our lives. And God wants to expand our capacity to receive, believe, and minister, and he uses pursuing the miraculous to do so. Bill Johnson often shares this story about a team, an expedition that climbed Mount Everest uh, years and years ago before at least a Westerner had summited the peak of, of Everest, and they had lost uh, a climber or multiple climbers on this climb. And so they had this banquet to commemorate their climb and to honor the lives of those who had fallen. And that mountaineer stood amongst this this group, and he spoke to Mount Everest as if Mount Everest was in the room. And he said, you've taken some of our best. And he says, but Everest, you can't get any bigger, but we can. And what he was saying was that there was a capacity that even though they had always, they had always been defeated by this mountain, they knew that if they persisted, there was a capacity growing in them that through failure and through struggle and through disappointment, there was greatness that was beyond if they would persevere through the struggle. And so what Jesus uses even with his disciples and what he uses in our discipleship is through the pressure, through the failures, through the wrong attitude, through the pride, through the rejection, through the disappointment, through the attitude adjustments that we need. He's building in us a capacity that maybe we failed or maybe we've been disappointed yesterday, but he's trying to do something in us so we can face the challenges of tomorrow with his heart and with his mind. You see... God not only used the miraculous to make the blind see and to make the lame walk, God used the, Jesus used the miraculous to make Peter, to make, to make John, come on, to, to, make, to make Andrew, to make, to make the different, to make Matthew, to make his different, to make them who they were called to be. And so, yes, miracles are first a blessing, but they're also a school. They're also a test, a class, a master class for us with the Messiah to see life as he sees it, to live from a renewed mind, to live from heaven to earth where we're seated in heavenly places with Christ. We approach things differently. We approach people's pain differently. We come with not just optimism, but we come with heaven's perspective. Come on. We come with what God could do in a situation. We come with a prophetic edge saying, yeah, you might be in darkness. You might be in addiction. You might be bad bound in sin. You might be bound in bad behavior or bad habit. You might be struggling with sickness or disease. You might be bankrupt. You might be at a part of a family that nobody ever graduated from high school. But I see somebody that's going to overcome. I see somebody who's ready for a miracle. I see somebody who's going to give God glory through showing up and manifesting in the middle of an impossible situation and circumstance. God doesn't just want to make miracles. He wants to make you. He wants to make you. He wants to make you more like Jesus, so that God would see the reflection of his son in your life. And he uses this journey of the miraculous and obedience and what he calls us to this great adventure as part of the script that he writes to cause us to reflect his glory. And he's calling us church to have his perspective, to have his heart and to have his mind, to be people full of faith. That somebody else sees somebody sick and dying and you see a miracle. You see an opportunity Ooh, somebody came in with crutches today. Somebody's got a cane. Somebody's got a hearing aids. Or somebody's got, you know, so you can tell. You can just see it sometimes. Or you hear a story, and you're like, God, this could be an opportunity for your glory. This could be an opportunity for the gospel to win people's hearts. And we come in the middle of people's stories with love. And it's, say it again, it's just such a high privilege and honor to be a follower of Jesus and to get to represent him. And to step into people's story in their darkest moments and turn the light on and point people to Jesus and to show people what his face is like, show people the goodness of his hand and the generosity and the compassion of his heart to alleviate suffering and cause people to come to salvation. What a, what a joy and a high honor. And I, I believe I'm part of a church that's like, let's go the long haul. But sometimes we got to open our heart to Jesus again and say, Jesus, I remember being, and I believe this could be a moment with the Holy Spirit. And I want to be careful to follow his leading right now as we close. But I remember being right out of college 
And I was at a, with a friend that had lost his dad to a disease. And he was very cynical. He was very hurting. And he was very angry at Christians that taught that God could heal. And I remember it was like, he started talking about things and it was like this unresolved grief. And we, don't get me wrong, we need to be there for people that are grieving and just love. It's not a time for answers and lectures and faith lessons and all that. It's just a time for love and compassion and just being present. But this, the way he vented this stuff on me, it's like I got kind of slimed. I, got, I kind of started carrying this mindset of like, yeah, who do these Christians think they are praying for healing? And yeah, we got to be careful about that. And we should, you know, and it actually pulled me out of a, a biblical worldview and away from God's heart. And I remember I went and it was the first time I heard Bill Johnson teach at Philadelphia Church. My dad would do these networks with all these leaders and they brought him in to speak to these. They would do these joint church meetings. There was like eight or 10 churches or so, 12 churches that were all together from the Seattle area. And Bill Johnson just came and taught about Bethel, the, the, the gate of heaven and earth, and how God wants to do the miraculous. And it was like, I literally felt myself get set free from that mindset. I didn't even know it was bothering me. And in that moment, it was like the weirdest thing, just while he was teaching, it was like the way my heart was closed to faith in God, literally just went, it was like the, the blinders went off. And I was like, oh, now I see, like, oh my goodness. And I believe that today God wants to remove unresolved grief. He wants to remove ungodly sorrow. He wants to remove any bitterness or hurts or disappointments that have maybe tainted the way you see God. Maybe you're like, I don't trust the church. I don't trust people. I don't trust God because you've just been through it. But it's those very pressures and disappointments and not always having the answers that God could be using to get your attention, to break in and show you more of who he is. And I believe that God wants to anoint us afresh with his power. I believe there's an anointing present today to see people released into following Jesus, into the miraculous, into carrying his kingdom power. And if you need healing today, it's a good day to get healed. But I believe that God also wants to do a work in people's hearts. Times where you've been mistreated in the church, you've been mistreated, you've been rejected because you tried to step out in faith. I've had that happen before. Man, religious people would be correcting me and you think, who do you think you are? As a young man stepping out, doing all this and da 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 da, and I'm completely misjudging my motives and what my heart is. Not that I'm above correction or whatever, but I've just, you know, you experience those things and it can make you kind of want to hesitate and not really be used to the Lord. And those things can have a bigger effect on us. And I just believe today that Jesus wants to set people free from that. He wants to set you free and liberate you, empower you today. He's got a great work for us to do in this generation. And I'd like us to stand on our feet as we close in prayer today. Jesus, I thank you that you're here and that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that you say to blindness, eyes be open. You say to deafness, ears be open. You say to cancer, be removed. Be healed in Jesus' name. I speak to spinal problems. I speak to imbalances. Right now, in Jesus' name, be healed. I speak to vertigo, seizures, migraines. Be healed in Jesus' name. I speak to people and family members who are on the spectrum. Lord God, Lord, I thank you for healing people. Lord, with ADHD, autism, Asperger syndrome, there's nothing too hard for you. We believe your word. We believe your word. But I pray, Lord, that you administer to the hearts of people that need liberty from where there's pains and hurts, where there's disappointments, where the pressure has been too much, where we're in, where we're in, uh, we're stuck in grief and we haven't been able to come through it in a normal cycle, Lord, where we just thought things were going to be easier and we haven't counted the cost, what it will take to persevere. Lord, I pray that you would deliver us from rejection, from disappointment, from other people's curses, from other people, for other people telling us that we're too excited or we're too zealous or trying to get too much attention, Lord, and we've let people's words get to us. Oh God, forgive us, deliver us. Where we've been unbelieving, where we've been hurt, where we've been angry or prideful, God, deliver us today. Minister your life and your freedom to us. And I just invite you, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, right now. Come in this place. Renew minds, heal hearts, heal bodies, deliver souls. Just come, just come. 
right now. If you need, if you if you need to respond to this word, just come to the altar right now. Just step forward right now. Just come out of your seat. Just come out of your seat right now. Others will join you. There is freedom today. There is freedom today. There is freedom today at the feet of Jesus. There is freedom today. There is freedom today. In Jesus' name. Lord, I just thank you. I thank you for who you are, Jesus. I thank you for your touch. I thank you for your touch. Jesus, more. More of you. Holy Spirit, more. Break off disappointment. Break off disappointment. Break off hurts, Lord. And cause faith to rise. A fresh faith. Lord, you're commissioning people to carry your power. For us to contend as a church. For us to stand in faith and to not let go and to not give up, Lord. And we just thank you, God, that you've marked us and you've called us and we can't get away from your calling, Lord God, because you love us, Lord God. And I declare that the love of God is swallowing up hurt. The love of God, the hope of God is swallowing up disappointment today. The hope of God is swallowing up where, where uh, hope has been diluted or it's been, it's been twisted today. There's a swallowing up of that disappointment with hope. I'm going to ask our pastors and our prayer team. People are beginning to experience the Holy Spirit. There's an anointing here today to set people free. There's an anointing to release people into their calling, into faith today. I want you to pray with expectation today. Others of you need to come for prayer today. If you need healing in your body, I want you to come. If you need freedom. I don't know if you're here today and your life is not right with Jesus. You're not right with God. This is a good day to give your life to Jesus. This is a good day for you to repent of your sin and to trust only in Him. Is there anybody here and you say, that's me, I, I need to give my life to Jesus. I've not done that before and I want to know that my life belongs to Him and that my sin is forgiven. Would you just wave your hand up if you say, that's me today? Maybe you already came to the altar, I don't know. If you're watching online, but if there's anybody here today, it's so simple, all you need to do is admit that you've sinned and that Jesus is the only way, and He will not offer you an easy life, but when you believe in Him, that He's the Son of God, that He died on the cross and that He rose from the dead, He will give you new life that starts the moment you say yes to Him. I want to make sure that if you've not made that decision, you need to make that decision. It's the most important decision that you can make. And we're here to pray today for people that need miracles, for people that want to be released in their heart. Lord, I pray that Your glory would continue to manifest I pray that your power would continue to release us from what would bind us and to bring us forward in the call and the anointing that you have for us, God. I pray for your power to be released. Lord God, I pray for creative miracles. We say yes as a church to running after the things of God. We say yes to the things of the Spirit, Lord. I pray that you would use us, that you would move us, that you would compel us by love to be all about Jesus and your glory that people would see Jesus in us. And I pray today, church, that Jesus would manifest over your life, that you would have a hunger for Him in the hidden, in the quiet place, that you would carry His presence and anointing everywhere you would go, that you would be aware of where He is at work, and that you would know that where to join Him, that He might be glorified in your life, in Jesus' name. Hey, this is gonna be a place of worship and encounter as the team leads. You're free to stay. You're blessed to go if you need to get your children. If you need to talk to God, this is an atmosphere for a breakthrough to receive. So if you want to linger for a little bit and just receive, He wants to do something in your life and in your family. Lord bless you today.